Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to Friday afternoon. I believe this is, is this Good Friday, so let's make it a Good Friday. Um, before we move forward with the agenda, there's been, as you probably a good number of you know, there have there's been some turnover on the board in, in the past few months. So we just wanted to take a moment and remind everybody of who the board members are, who the alternates are, uh, because there's a lot of interest in our organization. So I'm excited by that, but also just wanting to make sure that, that we all know who, who everyone is on our board. Okay. So uh, Auburn is uh, me and Jeff Tate is our alternate. Burian, the board member seat is vacant, but Colleen is doing a fabulous job as the alternate right now. Covington, we have Joseph and the alternate is Christina. For Des Moines, it's Tracy and the alternate is JC. Federal Way, Brian Davis, and as Angela mentioned, Sarah, the alternate, will be joining us today. For Kent, it's Dana, and Marina is the alternate. Maple Valley, we have Sean as the board member. Uh, I don't believe they have identified an alternate yet. Normandy Park is Eric, and the alternate is Amy. Renton is Ryan with Mark as the alternate. Tukwila is Cynthia, with the alternate being Deshaun, and for King County, it's Sonari, and Kelly is the alternate. Okay, excellent. All right, and you know, if we were if we were meeting in person, I think the the configuration of the room would make it more apparent who's on the board and who is a wonderful guest uh, or or amazing staff, but since we are on this virtual screen, it's sometimes not as easy for us to remember. So we just wanted to, to do that to remind everyone of, of board members and alternates. And because some of us have never even met in person. So always important that we, we make sure that we can place names and faces. So with that, Angela, you mentioned that you thought that we had uh, a quorum. So if you would please go ahead and call roll. Absolutely. Um, Nancy Backus, City of Auburn. I am here, thank you. Colleen Branch Sluter, City of Burien. I am here, thank you. And Christina, oh gosh, Christina, I'm so sorry with your last name. Will you pronounce it for me um, with City, uh, City of Covington? Sure, it's Soltis. It's, it's not too complicated. Okay, like just have it thank you. But not. <laughs> thank you, I'm here. Thank you. And um, do we have Sarah? I don't think we have Sarah yet from Federal Way. Um, Dana Ralph, City of Kent. Good afternoon, I'm here. Sonari Marshall, King County. Here. Sean Kelly with Maple Valley. I don't see Sean yet. Eric Zimmerman, Normandy Park. I'm here. Ryan McIrvin, City of Renton. Good afternoon. And Cynthia is out today with um, City of Tequila. And so that is everyone. All right, well, thank you and welcome. And again, thanks for joining us today uh, on- Tracy, I missed you. Tracy, <laughs> here. City of Des Moines, thank you. <laughs> She's waving at me because I missed you. I marked you here, but I didn't call you out. Thank you on this beautiful Friday. I don't know how many of you had snow yesterday, but we did here in Auburn and I, I saw a few cars covered with it even, but today seems to be a little bit more cooperative, some blue sky out there. So let's hope we can, we can expect some good weather this weekend. So we've done the roll call for the board, but I always like an opportunity for us to get to know who else is in the room, whether it be remote or in a physical location. So if we could go around, I'm, I just wanna start with one person who uh, some of you may not know in the current role, it's Jason Gothier, who is the new 
executive director for SHAPE, South Sound Housing Affordability, and there's two more A's in there, the last word being partners. Jason, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, if you, if you have an opportunity, and we welcome you. He's in his first days of, of this role. Thank you, Mayor Mackin. I'm on the road right now, back from a, a development tour in Tacoma with a number of our board members at SHAPE, but thank you for the introduction. Uh, and I'm looking forward to collaborating with Angela and Skip moving into the future. And uh, pleasure to be here as a guest today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. And as many of you know, since Auburn is situated between King County and Pierce County, we have the wonderful benefit of being members of both Skip and Shape. So uh, thank you, Jason, for joining us today. And Angela, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to call off because if we just try and say everybody just go ahead and and speak up, it, it gets to be everybody's jumping in at the same time. If you wouldn't mind calling the names of those uh, in the room. Sure, I will um, begin with um, our advisory board liaison. We have um, Dorsal joining us and give Dorsal your, a minute to introduce yourself. Um, I know this is your first executive board meeting. We're really excited to have you join us and um, really the advisory board um, liaison position in particular, creating that connection between um, our community board um, and our executive board. So welcome. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Dorsal Plants and I use uh, he, his pronouns. Um, uh, I have the uh, honor of being the uh, program manager at uh, Fusion. Uh, in particular, I run the Fusion Family Center, which is a 29 room enhanced family shelter for homeless families in federal way. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, this is just a room full of really big brains and amazing people. So it's an honor to be here and uh, I look forward to hearing and learning everything from you all. Thank you, Dorsal. Welcome and thank you for the work that you are doing on behalf of Fusion, uh, really on behalf of our community, but on behalf of, of Fusion and also for our advisory team. Thank you so much. I'll just work through my list. Amy. Okay, I'll, I'll just continue. Daphne. Daphne oh, Hernandez, there's... city planner, Covington. Sorry. No, perfect. Amy, I saw you come on camera, I'll circle back. <laughs> Hi, Amy Arrington, city manager in Normandy Park. And Ernest. Hello. Greetings and uh, enjoy the sunshine. Hannah. Hello, Hannah Bond Miller, City of Benton staff. And JC. Good afternoon. Joy. Hi, everyone. Joy Scott, she, her pronouns. I'm the Community Services Manager with the City of Auburn. Laurel. Hello, Laurel Humphrey, City of Tukwila staff. Thank you. Mark. Hello, uh, Mark Santos Johnson, City of Renton staff. Michaela. Hello, Michaela Dofferin with King County's Department of Community and Human Services, and I'm lead staff to the King County Affordable Housing Committee. Marina. Hi, Marina Hansen, City of Kent Human Services staff. Nicole. Hi, good afternoon. Nicole Nordholm, City of Des Moines staff. Nigel. Uh, Nigel Herbig, Intergovernmental Relations with the King County Regional Homelessness Authority. Paul. Hi, uh, Paul Tan, um, King County Regional Homelessness Authority, the South King Sub Regional Planner. Trish. Good afternoon, everyone. Trisha Bate, Skip Staff. And I have someone on an iPad. Would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, well, we'll come back. Well, 
Um, hi, everyone. I'll introduce myself, Angela Sanfilippo with SKIP, and to recognize also that we have Sarah with us so, now. Um, look it up. And then um, Greg, who is um, one of our guests today, if you want to do an introduction, and then I think that's the last one. Hi, all. Greg Colburn. Uh, I am in the Department of Real Estate at the P. Washington in Seattle. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here with us. All right. So let's go over the agenda. Uh, are there any modifications to the agenda? All right. I don't hear anyone jumping up and down wanting to make any modifications. So let's go to the approval of the March 18th, 2022 minutes. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. We have a motion from Dana. Do we have a second? Second. Tracy. Thank you. We have a second from Tracy. So uh, are there any questions or comments? All right. All those in favor of the approval of the March 18th, 2022 minutes, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. All right, uh, motion carries unanimously. And we will move to the educational item. Homelessness is a housing problem and how structural factors explain US patterns. So recently we know that the board has expressed interest in exploring Skip's roles in addressing homelessness. So we're excited to hear from the author and researcher on connections they have found between homelessness and housing market conditions. And Trish, I'm going to turn it over to you for a brief introduction, if you would, please. Thank you, Mayor. Greg is an assistant professor of real estate at the University of Washington's College of Built Environments. He has published research on housing and homelessness in journals like Urban Studies, Housing Studies, Urban Affairs Review, and Housing Policy Debate. Greg holds a PhD and an MSW from the University of Minnesota and an MBA from Northwestern University. Prior to academia, he worked as an investment banker and private equity professional. Greg is a member of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Family Homelessness Evaluation Committee and co-chair of the University of Washington's Homelessness Research Initiative. He is the co-author alongside Clayton Page Aldern of the just released book, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, which highlights how housing market conditions such as cost and availability of rental housing is a bigger driver of homelessness than conventional beliefs such as mental illness, drug use, and poverty. I'm really excited to have Greg with us today to present his work to you all. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Greg. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Trish. I really appreciate it. Uh, and just to manage time expectations, if I spend 25 or so minutes and then some time for Q&A, is that, is that appropriate? Great. Okay, I'm gonna share my slides here. Thank you all for, um, for inviting me, I'm really pleased to uh, share some of the uh, summary arguments that Clayton and I make in uh, in the book. Um, sorry, I'm going to try to get to a full screen here. Okay. I had a monitor malfunction, so I'm working on a different screen. So my usual setup is a little bit off, but are you seeing it okay? Great. Well, the name of the book is, as, as I mentioned, is um, Homelessness is a Housing Problem. And, um, you know, the, I was motivated to, to um, write this book for, for a couple of reasons. Um, I got to the University of Washington in 2017 and have been involved in a number of, of community conversations around housing and homelessness. And, and it was... I would kind of come home after these meetings and think like, boy, it just seems like we, the conversations are kind of all over the place and they're well-intentioned and smart people. And just, we had a lot of different areas of focus. And that's also true if you just open the Seattle Times or any other publication in our region. And so 
there was a lot of information known in the academic community um, in, in scholarly publications that I just didn't feel like was getting out into the general public. And so what I wanted to do was, was write a book that, that translated some of that information to a general audience such that if someone was walking around in Seattle and maybe works at Amazon and says, I don't understand why we have such a big problem here, that we could put in one book an explanation for, for the major drivers of, of the crisis in our region. And so that was that's the attempt and the motivation for, for the book. So, uh, you know, social scientists were very interested in causation. And, and so there will be all sorts of conversations in, in our community around what causes homelessness. And when we think about causation, um, sometimes causes in, in, in just our observable world are somewhat easy. If I drop a pencil and it falls to the ground, we'd say gravity caused that to happen. When we move into the social world, causation becomes really, really complicated. Okay? And one example would be if we said, what caused so-and-so to be admitted to Harvard? Well, it's complicated, right? There are a lot of forces that come together. They might be smart, might have had a good education, might have had good teachers. Maybe the grandparents gave a building, right? Gave $100 million to Harvard. We don't know. The reality is a bunch of things come together to produce an outcome. When we talk about homelessness, it is absolutely true. It is probably exhibit A for complex causality. All sorts of forces come together. Um, to produce a specific case of homelessness. And so I certainly will be the last person to, to stand up and say, I now know exactly what causes homelessness for every individual. I don't. Um, that's not the purpose of, of this particular book. And I do want to honor the fact that um, each case is unique and, and, and tragic in, in its own right, and all sorts of forces come together to, to produce this. But what's interesting is when we start to think about causation and homelessness, um, we conduct, at least prior to um, prior to um, uh, COVID consistently on a year-to-year uh, -year basis, a point in time count, uh, which in essence is the census and the, the continuum of care uh, in our region is uh, Seattle King County. And, um, but, a certain, but we also ask people questions during that time and say, you know, what, what really led to your bout of homelessness? And so we'd see lists like this, and I'm sure you've seen these lists many times. And so the Seattle Times will then publish them and say, well, here's what's causing homelessness for, for, for people. And when I look at this list, I always cringe a little bit because, um, who am I to say from my office at the University of Washington that these aren't the causes of homelessness, but I always kind of think, I, I just don't believe fundamentally that divorce and separation are the fundamental cause or, or a cause of homelessness. I just don't. Um, and so what we try to do in the book is to, is to honor these explanations, but also draw a distinction between what is a root cause and what's a precipitating event. Okay, if I get in an argument with my roommate, my roommate kicks, kicks me out and I have no other alternatives, that argument is the precipitating event that produces homelessness. There's a broader societal context and, and, and geographic context that produces the conditions in which that precipitating event um, leads to homelessness. And that's what we're trying to understand in, in this particular book and explain. So the analogy that I use for people when we think about causation and homelessness is a game of musical chairs. And, and it's overly simplistic, but um, I have found that this analogy actually has worked with a lot of people to kind of change the way they think about this. So imagine a game of musical chairs, 10, 10 people, 10 chairs. The leader starts the music, they start walking around in a circle. The leader pulls one chair out. We now have 10 people in nine chairs. When they stop the music, everyone scrambles for a chair and one person loses by definition. In this case, it was Mike who was on crutches because he had hurt his ankle. And so, if we were to interview Mike, or if we were to interview the other competitors in that competition after the fact and said, why do you think Mike lost? Everyone would say, well, Mike had an ankle injury. And so within, and, and that's true, Mike's ankle in, injury probably did cause him to lose that game. Within the specific terms and conditions of that game, 10 people in nine chairs, Mike's ankle injury was the cause. But if we were to take a step back, is Mike's ankle injury really the cause of his chairlessness? I would argue no, is the fact that we didn't have enough chairs. So the point is that when we have scarce housing, vulnerabilities are accentuated and we end up identifying people or people end up being identified as more likely to experience homelessness because of particular vulnerabilities. And this, this analogy, I think, helps us understand why some regions of the country have a much more significant problem with homelessness than other, um, other locations. So we know that um, there are some vulnerabilities that, that if you were to ask the general public uh, that are associated with, with um, Homelessness are, are absolutely prevalent um, or, or present, I should say. Drug use, mental illness, and poverty certainly increase the risk of experiencing homelessness at the individual level. There's no doubt about that. It is important to note that still a majority of people experiencing homelessness um, do not, are not uh, addicted or have substance use disorders or are not mentally ill. Okay. 
but they certainly are uh, overly represented in that population. But we also know that these conditions produce homelessness at high rates in some contexts, like Seattle and San Francisco and LA, and not others. And so that's what we really want to understand here. So the question we ask in the book is, why do rates of homelessness vary so much? Why does Seattle King County have four to five times the per capita rate of homelessness of Chicago Cook County? Do we have more homelessness here because we have more people with these individual vulnerabilities? It's an interesting question and, an, and a plausible explanation. It turns out the answer to that question is no. So this is a book about cities and communities, not about people. Um, Person-focused research is absolutely essential and there's a lot of wonderful research um, happening right now. So this is not to say that that's not important, it absolutely is. But the point of this book is to understand what is it about certain communities that produce high rates of homelessness well, while others don't. The point uh, in the punchline, um, which you may have guessed what it is based on the title of the book, is that tight housing markets accentuate vulnerabilities. And therefore, housing market conditions help us understand regional variation more so than do uh, individual vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities end up serving as, serving as a sorting mechanism in tight housing markets. It shouldn't come as a surprise in a very tight housing market like Seattle that people who are employed at Amazon are finding a chair and people who are not, or who are mentally ill, or, or dealing with substance use disorders, who are poor, whatever the case may be, um, are, not, are not finding a chair, or in this case, a housing unit. Uh, so just to set the stage on this variation, so the, the, this is the variation we're trying to explain. And so we, we group our communities, and we use about the 30 largest metro areas in the country in our sample. Because continuums of care, which is the unit um, that uh, serves, uh, uh, basically serves as a conduit for federal funding for homelessness, it also um, uh, is involved in the, in the homeless census. And because we group and aggregate um, in different ways in different jurisdictions, we need to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. So there are some COCs that only cover city borders, New York, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Boston, et cetera. And given that homelessness tends to be uh, uh, higher on a per capita basis in city centers as opposed to suburban locations, we want to compare cities to cities. We also have a number of COCs, King County included, that are county-based um, and therefore include suburban locations as well. All else equal, they will have lower rates of homelessness than city-based COCs. And so when we compare, we don't want to compare a county COC to a city COC. So the top part here is all the city COCs in our sample, and you'll see that there's about a five to one relationship between the high per capita uh, cities and low per capita cities. New York is about 10, nine and a half or so, and Indianapolis is just below two. And then obviously the different communities in between. So it's about a five to one ratio. When you move to the counties, it's, it's a lower level because we know that the suburban locations um, tend to bring down that overall per capita number. But what's interesting is it's again about a five to one ratio between the high per capita locations and the low per capita rations, low per capita locations. So Hillsborough County, uh, Hillsborough County, which I think is Tampa, if I remember correctly, um, is about one and LA County is, is over five. So is Santa Clara, King and Multnomah, right? So again, about a five to one ratio. So it's this five to one relationship that we're trying to explain in the book. So we start with the individual explanations because those are probably the most prevalent and the ones that people think about uh, most readily. There's no doubt that poverty is a, is, a, is a cause of homelessness, no doubt about it. But what's interesting is when you plot rates of poverty, um, in our city and counties uh, that we include in our sample against homelessness, what we see is actually a somewhat surprising result. And so just to orient you, the, the numbers on the bottom or the x-axis are rates of poverty. Um, the numbers on the left are rates of homelessness per 1,000 people. So these would be per capita rates. And the dots are an observation for each year uh, what the poverty rate is and the homelessness rate for, for each city and, and county. And so the R squared is, is just a statistical measure that says how much does poverty help explain variation in rates of homelessness. So when the R squared goes up, we would say that there's more explanatory power. When R squared is low, meaning close to zero, we would say there's not much explanatory power there. So here there is some explanatory power, but it's in the opposite direction of what we would think. Places with higher rates of poverty have lower rates of homelessness. Okay, so think of places like St. Louis and Detroit and Cleveland, which have far higher rates of poverty than do San Francisco and, and Seattle and other affluent cities. Okay, so it is very difficult to argue then that the problem that we have in Seattle is because we have a disproportionate number of poor people in our community. In fact, we have far fewer poor people in our community. The consequences of poverty are different. 
This is rates of serious mental illness and for mental illness and, um, and drug use, we actually use state level data, um, which um, comes from the federal government, but it's the same logic in the sense that we look at rates of homelessness and variation in rates of mental illness. Here we see there is some rate, um, some variation in state level rates of serious mental illness, um, but there, it bears zero relationship to homelessness. So the point here is that it's very hard to argue that the places with really, really high rates of homelessness have it because we have more people with serious mental illness. We don't. There are people with mental illness in every community and every state around the, the country. It's just that, again, the consequences of, of this vulnerability might be more acute in a place um, like Seattle or San Francisco than it is elsewhere. Illicit drug use, um, again, basically no relationship. 0 0.06 is the R squared, which in essence means there's no relationship. There is more drug use in some places than others, but again, it bears no relationship whatsoever to homelessness. So it's not that the state of Washington has more illicit drug use than other places in the country. This is substance use disorders, which would include um, legal substances like alcohol or marijuana. Again, uh, no relationship. So these, these conventional explanations that this is a drug problem really doesn't hold up to, uh, to statistical logic here. Okay? It might be that people experiencing um, homelessness in Seattle are disproportionately experiencing some of these disorders. That may very well be true, but it's not that we have more of those folks uh, in our community. So then we want to think about what are some potential explanations uh, here that are, that are um, contextual. And so people always say there's something unique about King County or Seattle that's causing this. Okay, and many of them might be political or weather or other types of explanations. So the first one I want to talk about is, is weather. Because we conduct our census, um, homeless census, at least in the pit count in January, um, this is the relationship between January average temperature and, and homelessness. And so I frequently hear people that say, well, the West Coast is, is moderate. We have moderate weather, therefore we have lots of homelessness. And when you plot uh, January temperature and homelessness, there's no relationship whatsoever. There certainly are warm, temperate places with high rates of homelessness, San Diego and, and um, in Los Angeles, for sure. But there are also warm places in Florida and Texas and Arizona that don't have high rates of homelessness. And there are plenty of cold places, Boston, New York, et cetera, that have high rates of homelessness. So we do see a relationship, and we discuss this in the book, between the policy response, meaning sheltered versus unsheltered. And so shelter capacity tends to be higher in places with colder weather. Um, but we don't see any relationship to total homeless population, which is the sum of the unsheltered and sheltered population together. I frequently hear that we are overly generous here, and therefore it is our generosity that's causing people to locate in our community uh, to take advantage of generous benefits. And so we attack that, um, that explanation in a couple of ways. This is looking at TANF, which is the primary federal welfare uh, program. And so when people say, oh, he or she receives welfare, typically what they're talking about is TANF, it stands for Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. And TANF came into play under uh, President Clinton in 1996 in the welfare reform uh, legislation. And one of the key features of that is each state had the ability to set uh, benefit standards. And so as a result, we have very, very different um, generosity of TANF um, throughout the United States. Okay? So what we do here is we take the maximum wealth benefit, TANF benefit in a state and divide by the median two bedroom rent to account for the cost of living in that particular uh, location to get a sense for the relative generosity. And what we see is there's some very generous places and some very stingy places. But when you plot it against homelessness, you see no relationship at all. So it doesn't seem to be much evidence that people are locating in communities um, disproportionately because of more generous uh, benefits. Another way we look at this is low income migration. Um, I have heard in Minneapolis, I've heard this in, in, in Seattle, I've heard it in California. In the book, we talk about Middleton, Ohio, who believe that they were a magnet for, for homelessness. Um, this is looking at um, the rate of low-income migration into um, a particular community. Um, and so the numbers on the bottom would be the percentage of people who um, are below the federal poverty line who are migrating into that community. Again, what we see is that there is low-income migration in every community around the country. Um, but we actually see a, a negative relationship, meaning more income, more low income migration actually is associated with lower rates of homelessness. So places like Baltimore and Philadelphia and Cleveland tend to have um, far higher rates of low income migration than do Seattle and San Francisco. Do we have people uh, moving to our community who are below the federal poverty line? Yes, but it's in relatively small numbers, less than 5%. So it's really hard to make the argument that there's this disproportionate migration into our communities because of uh, something about whether it's our generosity or, or otherwise. 
Another explanation we frequently hear is, is, um, is left-leaning uh, politics are to blame for um, the high rates of homelessness, especially on, on uh, coastal cities. So we actually took all the, the cities in our sample, cities and counties, and looked at um, which party was uh, in control in terms of, of, of mayors. And generally speaking, large cities in the United States are run by Democrats. 85% of the, of the years in our sample, uh, Democrats were in control, Republicans 8%, independents 7%. And so it doesn't, it doesn't really help us understand regional variation because ultimately if Democrats were to, are to blame for homelessness that we see in, in, in Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles or New York, um, why wouldn't we see problems in Chicago and Cleveland and many other locations that are democratic strongholds in this country? The point being that we don't really see that this, this narrative around um, local politics as explaining variation. We think that there's something else uh, going on here. And so when we, when we start to um, look at um, the final uh, category of explanations, um, we start to see some explanatory power here. And this is median contract rent uh, for each of the um, jurisdictions in our sample. And what you'll see is um, R squared numbers that are higher, much higher than we've seen elsewhere, and a relation, a positive relationship, meaning as rents go up, homelessness is higher. We also see a similar relationship with rental market vacancy rates. When vacancy rates are low, homelessness tends to be higher. And vacancy rates and rents are not independent variables, they're related, and so we're not suggesting these are independent. But what, what we're saying is that if you were to give me the rents and the, and the vacancy rate in a community and blindfold me and not tell me where it is, I could give you a pretty good sense of whether they're gonna have a problem with homelessness or not. The, 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 the predictive power of these, of these uh, variables is, is, is pretty strong. So the question is why do we have, and so Seattle obviously is a, a prime example of a place with high rents and low vacancies. So the question is why do we have those housing market conditions here? Is it because we have a lot of people moving to, to Seattle? Is this an Amazon, Microsoft issue? Partly, partly, but a really interesting finding is when we plotted population change um, and homelessness in our sample, we didn't find any relationship. And this was the most surprising thing that, that I saw in our, in, in, uh, in our book. And I ran it a couple of times because I thought I'd messed it up. And so when I actually dug into all the cities and looked at this, I found that there were actually a number of places, especially in the Sun Belt, that are growing as fast as, as King County, but we're not having the same issues that we had. Okay, so the point is, is that, do we need to focus on the demand for housing, which is population growth and wages? Absolutely. But that alone is insufficient to really understand what explains or what helps to, un, um, to drive a housing crisis. The other thing that we have to think about is the supply of housing. And so, um, Forgive me for, for briefly talking about economics here, but there's a notion in economics called elasticity. Uh, in, in this case, elasticity of supply. And the idea is that when the price of a good changes, a good or service, how much quantity will be supplied in response? So something like a pen, if the price of pens goes up a whole bunch tonight, what will happen tomorrow? Pen makers will supply a whole bunch of pens. And so we would say that pens have a very elastic uh, supply. Housing, by definition, has a much lower elasticity because you can't just build more housing tomorrow. It's going to take a long time. We also know that the elasticity of housing varies substantially from community to community around the United States. And the two major drivers of elasticity for housing is the regulatory environment, how easy is it to build housing, and the topography. Mountains and water make it harder to uh, build more housing. And so generally speaking, what you'll see is very low elasticity cities would be those that have a very um, strict regulatory environment and who border water and, and mountains. Okay, think San Francisco. Okay, think Seattle, think Boston. So what we do um, on, on this graph is, is to kind of help um, orient people to what's going on around the United States in terms of some of these important factors. So think of the x-axis or the bottom change in population as demand. So as population increases, demand for housing goes up. So the places on the right would have high demand for housing. The measure on the left is housing supply elasticity. One is considered neutral. Numbers higher than one would be elastic, meaning we build quite a bit of housing in response to price changes. And numbers below one would be inelastic, meaning we don't build a lot of housing when prices go up. And so what you'll see is the lower right quadrant here is, a, is the absolute recipe for a housing crisis. And we would argue uh, a crisis of homelessness. And that is rapid population growth with very um, restrictive housing supply. And the numbers in parentheses here are 
our rental market vacancy rates. And so you can see Boston, San Francisco, and Seattle, three cities in this little right quadrant, all have very, very low rental market vacancy rates. The interesting quadrant from my standpoint is the upper right, which is the Sun Belt, where we see rapid population growth, similar growth to what you see in the boom towns of, of Seattle, Boston, and San Francisco, but their supply elasticity is much, much higher. It's relatively easy to build from a regulatory standpoint, and they don't have um, topographical constraints. It's generally pretty flat and they can sprawl. Not suggesting that sprawl is the answer to all of our problems, we're just obviously highlighting the fact that these communities have built a lot of housing as their, as their populations have increased. And as a result, you see these rental market vacancy rates that are much, much higher than what you see in, in the lower right quadrant. And so there's a couple, you know, when we think about rates of homelessness, um, the Rust Belt doesn't have on a per capita basis a huge problem with homelessness. Why? because their rents are really, really low. They have very, very high vacancy rates. And so one way to get to uh, a relatively low rate of homelessness is industrial decline, which no city aspires to, right? That's not what people are looking to be. I wanna be the next Detroit, but it is one way. They have plenty of problems in Detroit and, and Cleveland, um, but, but homelessness is not as high on the list. The Sun Belt also has figured out a way to have relatively low rates of homelessness, and, and, and part of that is just to build a whole bunch of housing in response to rapid growth. And they've kept home prices more moderate and vacancies a little higher. Mega cities like New York and LA have very inelastic housing supply and they still have growth, and they have a housing crisis and a homelessness crisis, as do the boom towns like Seattle, San Francisco, Boston. And so when we think about this, and, uh, and many of you are very, very close to this and probably closer um, uh, closer than I am to, to the actual policies that we're gonna enact on the ground. But generally speaking, um, when I give a talk to just a general audience, you know, we make substantial investments, um, operating investments to support people experiencing homelessness and people who are precariously housed. And those are absolutely necessary and life-saving. And so I absolutely advocate for continuing to fund housing support of various um, um, uh, forms um, and, and the supportive services that, that people need. But it is important to note that these operating investments many times are not meant to end the crisis, they are meant to treat the crisis. And therefore, if we want to begin to make a major dent in, in the housing and homelessness crisis in our region, we absolutely need capital investments to construct more housing. And where housing is difficult to construct, we need to have regulatory and land use policy changes uh, to in, order, in order that we can do so. Now, People say, well, Greg, so we just built a whole bunch of market rate housing, we'll be fine. The answer to that question is no. Do I want more market rate housing built in our region? Absolutely. And I support developers who wanna do that. But if we're gonna have an honest conversation about uh, a housing need in our community, unless we construct affordable housing, workforce housing, and supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness, we will not end this crisis. And simply building million dollar condos will not do so. Okay. And so therefore, um, Relying solely on the private market to end this crisis, in my opinion, is is folly. And it's not that the private market is bad. Uh, we can have that's a separate conversation for another day. But I don't believe it is the best path to ending this crisis, because the math doesn't work. It's very very hard to construct housing in Seattle that's affordable to someone who can only pay three or four or five hundred dollars a month. But housing is expensive. So per the McKinsey report that came out a couple of years ago, um, their estimate of the number of units we would need to support people experiencing homelessness and also other extremely low income households was 37,000 new units. Their estimate of that cost would be about $11 billion. It's probably more than that now given, given inflation that we're seeing in, in, in the construction industry. Um, and so it's a big number, you know, a billion dollars a year, um, four times what, what the region is, is paying right now. Um, and so when I, when I mentioned that number to people, people roll their eyes and say, oh, it's just more money, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is our, re our region has made big commitments elsewhere. We've made a huge commitment to transit over the next 25 years. Okay? And so the, the issue that we have to a certain extent with housing is that we think about housing as a private good. And we think about transportation and other things potentially as public goods. And so I think, I think our region is starting to recognize that housing is infrastructure. And if we start to frame housing as infrastructure rather than housing as a personal investment, then we can start to think about the major investments that we need to make such that um, people who wanna live and work and raise their kids in this region can do so. Because right now we're getting to the point where that is not possible. Even if you happen to be a third grade teacher in the Seattle Public Schools, very, very difficult to afford uh, to live in this region. 
And obviously, as we move down the income um, ladder, that the, the difficulty increases immeasurably. Okay, and so we need a portfolio approach in the sense that we need to promote housing support at all levels, from market rate all the way down to supportive housing. And the public sector um, uh, role will be different at each of those levels. At the market, um, at market rate, it might just be let's make sure that we have uh, a regulatory environment in place that that can be built efficiently and quickly. And when we move down to supportive, it will involve more resources. It absolutely will involve more resources than it needs to if we're gonna really make a dent in this. And so um, to conclude here, we have continually um, as a society uh, focused on individual deficiencies when we talk about homelessness. And instead, uh, and instead what we need to do is think about this as a structural problem. Okay. There are all sorts of forces to come together that produce um, poverty, and that can be uh, uh, institutional racism, right? different uh, levels of education for different people, different levels of, of health care. All of these forces come together to produce disadvantage, and then we end up seeing this disadvantage manifest itself in the population of people experiencing homelessness. Right? Indigenous and Black uh, uh, individuals and families are, are woefully and, and dramatically overrepresented in the homeless population. And this is a function of structural factors over generation after generation after generation. And so we need to start thinking structurally and, and the, the frame for our book is one of, of, of housing. Um, and that a structural response is we need to make sure that there, the housing market is there uh, to support people who need them. And so when people say, well, Greg, I just don't buy that, that more housing will fix this. I'll say, well, the, the best example we have is, is our, our nation cut veteran homelessness in half or less 10 years. And how did we do that? We gave people housing. And some of that was giving people a unit. Some, some people got a voucher. Other people got a, a unit and supportive services given their particular circumstance. But we know it works. The question is, will we apply that same logic to a broader population of people who have uh, real housing needs? So thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to um, answering any questions or hearing any comments that you, uh, that you might have. Wow, thank you, Greg. Um, that, that was a lot of information and that's amazing, the amount of, of research that you uh, did on the topic. Does anyone have question over what was presented uh, or any questions of Greg Tracy? Uh, thank you, Chair. Wow, what a... a, a bowl full of data and information in such a short period of time. You did a great job. Uh, while you were <laughs> while you're talking, I already went to Amazon and ordered your book. Oh, thank you. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I thought, well, it probably wouldn't be appropriate to put the link in the chat, but uh, everybody could figure that out, I guess. Okay, so my question is, one of the things that you talked about is, um, our high regulatory environment and how it can be a barrier. And I think uh, our particular environment, as comparable probably to LA and San Francisco, some of these other coastal cities, the state of Washington, the Puget Sound Basin in particular, is kind of a spearhead in the nation for environmental um, considerations. I mean, we we create more legislation to protect the environment, I'm guessing, than, than most states in the nation. And I think that that, I think you're correct, that is a barrier. I mean, we protect our water and soil uh, probably more than most, but we have more of it coming out of the ground and out of the mountains into our metro areas more than most, I think. Well, our metro areas are probably closer to mountains than most metro areas. So all that saying, do you have any recommendations about reducing our, some of this regula our regulatory environment while still considering uh, what we want to do in preservation here, like with the Growth Management Act and things like that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's um, astute people will typically, that will be one of the first questions they ask me, which is, um, we're going to now pit housing people against environmentalists. And my answer to that is, I, um, I actually believe if we think about cities right now, the two major crises we face, one is, one is climate change and, and one is housing. I think, I think a lot of people, mayors and, and people around the country would say that. I would argue that denser housing is the answer to both of those issues. 
right? Sprawl is going to not be, we're not gonna be good stewards of the environment if we do that. And so I actually don't believe that these two things need to be in conflict. Will there be circumstances in particular regulatory provisions that where there might be some conflict? Yes, I'm not naive to assume that, but I ultimately think if we build denser cities, rely on transit, allow for um, people to live and work near transit such that they, they can operate and, and work throughout a community, I believe that is, um, it is, uh, I think, being good stewards of our land. I think it's better use of our land. I think it will uh, improve affordability. It will improve um, transportation. And I also think it's good from an environmental standpoint. And so ultimately, um, that would be my overarching answer to that. Given my conversations on the real estate industry, I think there are a lot of regulatory tweaks and I'm more familiar with the city of Seattle than some of your jurisdictions, but I know that there are regulatory tweaks that we can make that do not put the environment at risk that also make it a little easier to um, get um, housing built. And so I was on a call with Mayor Harrell two weeks ago. The first question he got was, how do we get a permit, right? And so there are some things that, you know, and, and part of the, some of these regulatory um, provisions do delay getting a permit, but there are things that can be done to improve this. And so, um, so I'm dodging your question to a certain extent, but I just, I, I don't buy the argument that these two things need to be in conflict. I really don't. And I ultimately think denser housing uh, and, land, and proper land use is the answer to both of those um, answers. And then I think from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, it's really getting people around the table and saying, what do we need to do to move this along? Because the time delay is incredibly costly, both in terms of dollars, as well as cost of households when we don't have enough housing. Thank you, Greg. Eric. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Greg, when we're trying to think of solutions for you know the, the homeless homelessness crisis and housing crisis. Yeah. We wanna be thinking in terms of solutions that are sustainable and durable. And from our city's standpoint, it's hard to contemplate um, housing you know, availability being a really sustainable and durable solution for homelessness for individuals you know, when methamphetamine and fentanyl continue to be so readily available and easily available and accessible uh, for individuals that are tragically addicted to these substances uh, and where their addiction is their primary barrier to um, housing sustainability. How did your research touch, if at all, on that inignorable, unignorable relationship between uh, substance abuse and, and um, the ability to stay in housing uh, and for housing to be both sustainable and durable uh, for those at-risk individuals? Yeah, so uh, there's no doubt. And, and I think um, an important point that we make in the book that I think is really important for everyone here to understand is that um, drug use and homelessness has two causal arrows. In some cases, people might be addicted and that addiction might then lead to um, them to lose a job and, and lose stable housing and experience homelessness. No doubt, that certainly happens. But we also know that homelessness causes mental illness and drug use. I tell people, and this is not a joke, that I would medicate if I were experiencing homelessness. It is an incredibly traumatic experience. And so the fact that you might confront someone on the street corner who is clearly addicted or experiencing mental illness, we don't know if that's the condition that caused the homelessness or if it is a consequence of the homelessness. And so I am a firm believer that absolutely there are people with very serious addiction issues and we need to provide um, services, housing and services to them. But I can tell you, beating those addictions without being housed is going to be exceedingly, exceedingly difficult. Housing first works. The biggest constraint we have to housing first in our region is we don't have units. It's a great intervention, but if you have no place to put them, people always say this to me, well, if housing first worked so well, Greg, why do we have a problem? It's like, well, if we had more units to put people in, we could actually use the intervention the way it was designed to be used. And so is there a subset of the population that needs intensive services because of addiction? There's no doubt about it, but I fundamentally, I fundamentally believe that if we had proper housing, this issue would not be nearly as severe. The biggest Issues with drugs in our country are West Virginia and Arkansas and places where the opioid epidemic has ravaged those communities. They don't have homelessness problems. I mean, they do, but it's at you know, one fifth of what we have. If that were really the fundamental driver, they should be exploding and they aren't. And so I do believe that housing is healthcare. Housing is treatment. And so some people will need additional treatments, but for a lot of people, housing will, will take care of it. And it would also cut down all those folks who end up using and abusing as a response to their experience. But it's difficult, and, and that's why I wanted to write this book because I've had the, you know, everyone has had the experience of walking around and confronting someone and it's an emotional experience. I feel threatened, I'm uncomfortable, and that then sticks, and I get it, I get it. And that's why 
um, this is a difficult um, conversation for the general public to, to wrap their heads around because their, their visible and emotional experience with this is of someone who's addicted or mentally ill on the street. And it's, that's, that's the tough um, uh, connection to unwrap. Yeah, thank you, Greg. And, you know, uh, anecdotes are always um, non-scientific, but my own anecdote is multiple people uh, in my immediate family have struggled with staying housed and in yep. each case for them, the drugs came first. Um, and so, you know, I know that, that an anecdote isn't the, the scientific reality, uh, but I think there's a lot of people who look at the issue and they struggle to connect with the academic answer because the academic answer doesn't connect with what's actually actually happened in their personal lives and with their family members. So I'm just one case, uh, but that's that's my own background on the issue is I've seen it. Uh, the drugs came first and the housing um, crisis followed. And and and. There's no, and there are people, and not just in your family, that for whom that is absolutely the case. And therefore, the question then becomes is what, what is the right service model to ensure that these people can become stably housed? And it might be more intensive than it would be for other folks. It's absolutely an issue. And, um, and so I, 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 you know, I want to honor in that experience that, that you've had. And it's also how quickly we can house someone who has recently become uh, unhoused because once you have been outside for quite a while, you are chronically homeless, it is exponentially more difficult to get someone into housing and to sustain that housing. Christina. Thank you. Hello, guys. Thank you, Greg, for that amazing presentation. It was very informative. Um, my question is about jobs, very simply put. I know that if I were out of a job, if my husband were out of a job, that would probably be the biggest factor in our case that would then lead us to homelessness. Is there any association or research done on association between homelessness rates and unemployment rates? Uh, I find that right now, particularly at least in our area, it's difficult to find employees. Um, there are plenty of jobs and yet very few workers. And our homelessness is quite high in this region. Um, and I'm just curious, is there any research done on that correlation? Yep, um, so uh, employment is one of the um, measures that we look at in the individual chapter. I just didn't have it in the presentation because of time limitations. Um, homelessness is actually uh, lower in places where unemployment is high. Uh, and so unemployment rates in, in the Rust Belt, for example, are very high, homelessness rates are low. And so generally speaking, um, you know, the homelessness, or excuse me, the unemployment rate in Seattle, San Francisco, New York, Boston is, is razor thin. We have very, very low unemployment, yet high rates of homelessness. So it's, it's similar to the poverty story. Um, and so, um, but your question then gets to, what is the relationship between jobs, housing, and, and, and homelessness? And, and I would say, um, I, I led, um, an evaluation of the of the um, hotel intervention by King County last uh, summer, or I guess it's almost two summers ago now. And what was interesting is in, when we interviewed folks, they moved from congregate shelter into the hotels. Um, uniformly, they all said they were feeling so much better because they had a they had a bed and they had a bathroom and they had a door that they could lock. And and many of them spoke about I feel so much more confident I'll be able to get a job now because I'm shaving, I'm showering, I'm um, I don't have to bring my belongings to an interview. Um, and so I had one person tell me, he's like, have you ever tried to get a job when you have to bring your earthly belongings to an interview? I said, no, I've never had that experience, but I can understand it's a major issue. And so um, I, I, the reason I study housing and why I'm passionate about housing is because I think of Maslow's hierarchy, if you remember this from middle school science, in the sense that unless basic needs are met, it is very hard to achieve the outcomes that we want. And so when people say I care about um, education, I care about employment, I care about health care, all these things, I do too. If you don't get housing, it's very hard to have a good education, it's very hard to have good health care, and it's very hard to have a job. And so I do believe it's fundamental to these outcomes that we care about throughout society. Um, and in trying to jump to education, you know, when people say, well, we have a tutoring program for kids experiencing homelessness, I'll say that's great. You know what would really help them is having a bed and a door. You know, I think what you'd see is their educational outcomes would improve a lot. And so it's and I so it's a, it's a it's a really tricky it's a really tricky question, um, but I do think it's going to be tough to solve if we if we can't get people housed. Yeah. So without dismissing the importance of the fundamentals and the necessary, it seems like it's almost like a 
chicken or the egg? Do you house them first or do you or do they work first and get off drugs first, basically? Yeah, and yeah. which we're gonna put emphasis on versus the other, right? Yeah, it's a good, good question. The housing first literature would strongly suggest that trying to fix these other issues before housing is a, is is you're doomed to fail. You're doomed to fail. And so the evidence is overwhelming that getting people stably housed first and then working on other issues is that is the proper sequencing of events. And and for some people, they don't like that idea. They want to have sober housing and want people clean before they get in. Unfortunately, the evidence suggests that 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 success is is very limited in that if you go in that order. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, I think that's where some people do get frustrated without the understanding of uh, if you if you have someone who you have been successful getting them through, let's say, uh, drug rehabilitation, they're still homeless. You have someone who is in recovery but is still homeless, and so uh, I use that Maslow's hierarchy of need often when we're talking about this topic. Um, I do have a question for you, or maybe it's more of a comment because we just finished uh, the legislative session and there were some real challenges facing cities with some of the missing middle housing. And while I think the intent of the legislation was good, it failed to take into consideration what cities were already doing and the fact that there are housing action plans that the state funded uh, to significant dollar amounts in sessions two or three years ago. And so it would completely wipe out the good work that has been done and the implementation plans that are in place. Um, so like I can say, while I, while I think the intention is good, it missed the mark because they didn't work with cities. But I do have a question for you because um, we're talking about the cost of low-income housing, affordable housing. And over the course of time, and, and you were talking about the, the conflict between environment and housing, because the state has implemented some significant cost increases to building homes uh, and not on the cities, but to the builder. Uh, so how do we, when, when the NPDES will increase the cost of a home by 20 to $30,000, and that went up just a few years ago, how do we reconcile that, Greg? Do you have any, do you have any recommendations on how we work on things like that? Yeah, I, you are so much closer to that than I am. And so I would, I would um, be outside of my lane to really speak to any of those specifics. I do think, um, uh, you know, having conversations and blunt conversations about balancing that need between being good stewards of, of the earth and, and ensuring that people have a place to live is, is absolutely essential. Um, I, uh, where I live, a, a local church just um, got approved to build affordable housing on their, on their land. And, and someone was protesting that we were chopping down trees. And I almost stopped to have the conversation, but I was tired and I didn't. And, but I mean, this is a, this is a conversation that we're going to have. And, and so um, I, I don't mean to dodge your question, but I, all, we absolutely need to build more housing. We need denser housing. I do believe denser housing is going to be good for the environment. The path to getting there though, will be messy and it needs to be have, having a bunch of people in the room. And what Mayor Harrell said is we need to have people who understand how to build housing and we need to have people who write regulatory stuff all in the same room and we got to hammer this out. And I do think that needs to happen between, between cities and the state as well. Uh, because I, I do think that um, when there's misalignment there, it ends up leading to inefficiency and, and, and we end up working at cross purposes. Absolutely. So I, su I support you and, I, and I, I, I wish I knew more about that, some of those details. Thank you, Greg. Um, Dorsal, as an advisory committee member, I will um, allow you <clears throat> to ask your question, but unless you are on the board, uh, we will not be taking questions uh, uh, from other people who are attending today. Dorsal? I apologize, and uh, thank you. No, 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 that's, you're, you're fine. 
Um, I was just wondering, because I'm actually from West Virginia, I was born and raised there. And so I was wondering, uh, as part of your study, you're correct, the, the homelessness and poverty looks very differently from where I come from here. But part of that, talking about housing regulation is because that the housing that you can build or live in in West Virginia would not be allowed to, it would not be considered a home in King County. And so when you looked at comparisons, did you look at the livability of the housing versus just housing? We, it's, um, it's a great point. One of the things that we highlight in the book is that um, with a few exceptions, generally speaking, housing quality in the United States is relatively high if we compare it now to 50 years ago. And one of the disconnects we have in our housing policy, and this occurs at the federal, state, and local level, is we mandate a certain level of housing quality, um, and yet we don't provide resources to people who can't access that housing. And that's what we have going on here, right? And where in some rural locations in West Virginia or Arkansas, um, there might be lower quality housing and that then creates some affordable housing. You can argue whether it's good or bad. It has in a way prevented homelessness, but it's not probably housing at the level that we as a society would want for everyone. But mandating high levels and then not figuring out how the lower 20% of people are gonna access that housing to me is a square peg in a round hole. And we're living that every day. And so you're absolutely right to call it out. And I wish I had a better answer for you other than um, what's, what we're doing right now across all levels of government doesn't work because people can't access that higher quality housing. We're just flat out messed up. We have some issues. <laughs> there are numerous issues and that's our goal here is to try and find ways to remove those barriers and provide housing and the services for individuals in our community. They are still members of our community and um, we want to treat them as such. Any other questions for Greg? Um, do we, are the slides available that you showed today, Greg? Will we, will we have access to those? I can, I can send those over. Perfect. Thank you so much. I know that people will want to will want to go over all of those great points that you made today and and kind of absorb it. I know I would love to. So I appreciate that. Um, Sonari, did you have? Yeah, I'm just going to take what Marty would normally say in his former role, which is that uh, Greg will also be part of HDC Affordable Housing Week coming up in May. And as a as a board member, I invite you all to attend that and uh, all of the other awesome events going on. You have done a fabulous job of channeling Marty. Thank you, Sonari, very much. Greg, we so appreciate your time. Uh, I've got your book up here too. I'm gonna get it on Kindle though. Wonderful. Uh, so I can take it with me all the time. Appreciate you very much. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for the invite and thanks for all the work, good work that you all do. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, we will move on and there are links in your materials to uh, some uh, interviews with Greg and Clayton Page. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Angela and Sonari have put a few links and comments in the chat function today. So if you get a chance, please make sure that you are taking a look at that before we are done. Um, we will move on to old business. It sounds bad, doesn't it? Old business. Anyway, under that, we will go to executive board group agreements, and that is attachment B in your packet. So as we mentioned in the, at the beginning of the meeting, recent board meetings uh, have made it apparent that the executive board would benefit from coming up with group agreements to establish a foundation of safety, respect, and trust that will help the executive board handle discussions and challenging topics raised during the meetings. And so I am going to turn this over to Angela to facilitate a discussion on the draft group agreements. Thanks so much, Chair. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody um, taking the time to take a little bit of a step back from the work that you all are doing at these meetings um, and talk about group, group agreements. This is 
um, something that Trish led with our advisory board at kind of day one of them meeting and convening as a group. Um, but it's never too late, right, to talk about what you all need um, in this space to really engage and participate fully um, as a group. So um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to go through um, a draft. We talked with the staff work group um, and thought that it would um, be um, very helpful if we provided a place to start the conversation for you all. So this is really just a draft that's in front of you of some suggestions to get the conversation started. Um, I will pull them up here in just a second, um, but it's nice to see all your faces as I, as I talk to you for a minute. Um, I did include um, on the draft very um, intentionally to just um, ground us in Skip's mission, um, as well as the role of the executive board, and then the intention and purpose of those group agreements, um, recognizing um, that all of these really kind of tie back to Skip's overarching mission as a regional collaborative um, to address affordable housing um, issues across South King County. Um, and then our role as an executive board um, as the governing body of SKIP and really making decisions that impact our region together. Um, so in the group agreements themselves are um, really intended to be a set of guidelines um, for how this board will handle discussions, um, you all tackle some very challenging and complex topics. Um, so the intention is really to help provide a foundation of safety, respect, and trust um, that acknowledges each of your um, individual experiences and right to respectful treatment. Um, they're intended really as a way to hold each other accountable um, and work effectively and respectfully so that, um, as I said, each of you um, feel um, safe in this space and are able to participate um, fully within each meeting. So I'm going to pull these up um, and I just um, would welcome all kind of take notes on this um, so you can kind of see them trying to capture what you all are sharing as well. So I'll just be um, taking some notes as we go through this as well. So bear with me one second while I share my screen. And this is um, just the attachment that was in attachment B in your um, agenda packets. Um, so as I said, that begins with the mission, the role, and then the group agreements themselves, um, followed by those draft um, group agreements that um, we put together. Um, I did have a series of questions. The first one um, just being, are there, are there um, ones here that resonate with you that feel really relevant? Um, so I would just start with that as you read through these, um, if any of these really speak to you. Um, I'd love to hear um, from you all just your kind of um, initial reactions. So Angela, I'll start because I am a fan of Ted Lasso. So my favorite one is going to be, be curious and respectful. It should be, um, as Ted would say, be curious, not judgmental. So uh, I am gonna say that that is my favorite one. And if you haven't watched Ted Lasso, you've got to do it. It is a guilty pleasure. It gives me so much joy. I love that you brought that up because it really does bring me a lot of joy and um, yeah. <laughs> Other initial reactions or those that really resonated with you? If I may, since I, I'm, I'm not using the hand raise feature, sorry. But um, something that I've found um, in, in many people's lives and including my own um, is that sometimes we can be hardest on ourselves. And Sometimes that's good because that pushes you, but oftentimes we don't have enough grace. So, yep, have grace with yourself and others and others. That's obviously very important. Um, it just resounds really deep. Trish, 
Tracy? Thank you. So uh, is this gonna, when, when this gets completed, will this be something when you're appointed to one of our boards, whether it's the executive board or the advisory board, that a member would sign this like as an agreement to like in uh, code of ethics um, or? I think that's a good suggestion. Um, it would be used as kind of part of our onboarding process, but I think the signature does um, represent a little bit maybe more accountability there. So I'd, I'd kind of pose that question to the group if you all feel that that would be helpful. Um, we certainly can um, incorporate that into kind of onboarding um, as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good idea. I know that at uh, Sound Cities Association, we do something like that. It's a I care, it's an agreement like this and it, it, we incorporate these um, guiding principles. And a lot of these remind me of the guiding principles that Sound Cities has. Um, think of who's not at the table, uh, assume best intent, uh, no surprises at the, at the table or no surprises at the dais, things like that. Just a, a set of principles that, that respects everybody around the table on several fronts. And, and so I appreciate all of this and, and I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Sonari? Yeah, um, going back to the, I, I support what Tracy said first. <laughs> um, and then uh, going back to the question of which one resonated, I think just because traditionally, so when I was a little kid, I was like, I had like a voice that was very, very soft and I never talked. And so the one that is have courage to interject if something is going amiss or being left unsaid, making the visible invisible visible is one that I even now still have to remind myself often of. Um, this would be surprised you all because I talk all the time in this meeting, but um, you know, in other meetings, perhaps it's, it's a challenge. So that one resonates. Eric? I, I actually was just gonna say the same one, um, maybe uh, interpret it just from a slightly different framing, but uh, agree that that's a really important uh, part of the conversation and making sure that um, a, a point of view uh, or a area of investigation is, is never ruled out. Any other initial reactions? Are there things that you all would change or are there any, is there anything missing? Sonari, is your hand up again? Yeah, I put it down okay. and I put it back up, Perfect. but <laughs> that's how I'm rolling today. Um, so there's one that, uh, I think there's two different ways to say it. One, I have a team member who, who one of her personal mantras is, I believe that success is in inevitable um, and just that we always kind of have to keep the optimism going. And I think in this case, as Greg laid out, it's, it's particularly hard. Um, I think the other way we, I've seen that in group agreements recently is, you know, think big, think small, but believe in the power of this group to make a positive change. And I, and I think kind of keeping our eyes on like, we are here to collectively solve a problem is it's related to that top one, but like, and we can actually make a difference on it, right? If we put all of the power and intention into this space, we can actually make a positive change. Not sure if I fully captured that, but I'm trying to get at the, um, the comments there. I think Tracy, I heard you talk about um, no surprises. And I will say that, um, Dana shared um, the 2021 guiding principles from SCA, which was really helpful for us when we um, were putting this together. Um, but no surprises is not on here. So I would, I would ask you all, should, should that be included here? Tracy? So I, I just sent, I just did a little copy paste of those and sent them to you in an email. So, but you know, some of the things here are similar in concept and duplicates of, of that. So um, I, I think no surprises. I think that's probably been in 
um, like boots on the ground for me, one of the most meaningful principles that I try to operate by both in my own council and all the boards that I participate in is I really try hard not to take people off guard and surprise them uh, so that nobody has to feel like they're unprepared for any questions I might have um, or what I wanna bring to the table. I'm not perfect at it by any means, but it's, it's one of the most, I think, important guiding principles that I have in order to give respect for anybody around the table. I don't, wouldn't want anybody to feel uncomfortable, caught off guard, humiliated um, by, by anything. So that's been a really valuable one for me. Um, thanks, Angela. Dana. Thank you. So definitely um, agree with that. I think that the, the second half of that no surprises for me is that not looking for gotcha moments um, that, you know, we're just, we're honestly working through conversation and it's not trying to set somebody up to, to say gotcha. I think that that's, I think that that happens and it's not ever productive. Um, and then to Christina's point, the, the have grace um, with yourself and others, it's hard to do on both fronts. And I've got a, a little sign in my office that says grace and strength, because you can be graceful and be strong at the same time. And I think sometimes they feel like they balance or they counter each, each other out. And so I think it's a good reminder. So I, I really like both of those. And I've never seen Ted Lasso, so I have no idea. Sorry. Oh, Dana. Oh my goodness. I don't have Apple TV and I pay for way too many other TV. You come over to my, I'm going to come over to my, my house. My login. <laughs> come over to my house, Dana, and we'll watch it and drink some wine. You'll love it. I love, I love that idea, Nancy. <laughs> oh no. Ryan has never <laughs> Trish and Ryan have not seen it either. Oh my goodness, you don't know what you're missing. I started watching it because I'm a soccer fan, but you do not have to like soccer in the least in order to be a huge fan of the life messages that Ted Lasso provides you in every episode. I think it sounds like a party at Nancy's house. Right? Let's do that this summer. BYOW. <laughs> That's right. That sounds like a great idea, Christina. We should have a get together one of these days. Yeah, I love that. Does anyone have any items on this list? I think they probably all resonate with us. Is there anything on here that people are questioning? It's like, mm, is that really the way we want to say that? Or I don't know that that should be something that we are considering. Uh, let us know that as well. Otherwise, we will assume that you are supportive of all of these items and behaviors, if you will. Okay. All right. What do you all think of, just to follow up on Tracy's suggestion, what do you think of Tracy's suggestion as this is something that you all sign on to? So I could send it out to you all as um, existing board members and then for new board members, it's part of our onboarding and then that signature component, just really um, ensuring that everybody is, is signing on to these group agreements when they come on board. Any thoughts on that? some thumbs up okay yeah i like the idea i think we should all have code of ethics code of conduct that we are you know, sometimes it's unwritten sometimes it needs to be written but these are all good reminders from my perspective uh, that that we operate by okay all right well, we are still ahead of schedule. I shouldn't say that. I'm putting that out in the universe and now we'll get behind. But uh, Angela, anything else on that one? 
No, I think, I think that's great. I think um, your all kind of general agreement is good. These are, um, you know, I don't have it as a resolution or anything, but um, just having the discussion and having um, all of you kind of help to create these together is really helpful as we move forward as a group. And we'll um, follow up with Tracy's suggestion as well as just um, revisit these, um, I think from time to time during our meetings as well. Great. Thank you for putting that list together. And thanks, Dana and Tracy, for sharing the, the SCA guiding principles. I think a lot of us on the call are probably familiar with those. It's always a good reminder. All right, we will. So I have on here that there's a motion. Did you want a motion today, Angela? I didn't. I'm OK without sure. it, but okay. um, if you feel like it's necessary, I think I I don't necessarily, I don't think it's necessary. I don't have it as a resolution or anything for you, so. Okay, because I do have it written on here that the motion is to approve skip executive board group agreements. So uh, we can we can bring it back next time then if you if you're not ready for that today. If you all are ready, I can put I could put it up there. We can do a motion. That's great. I'll put it back up with um, how the changes that we made, if you all are comfortable with those. Okay. Let's see. Defined it again with all my multiple documents. Sorry about this. <laughs> Course. Oh my goodness, this is embarrassing. We can't find it again. There it is. Okay. There you are. All right, so it looks like we start with keep focused on our collective goals and stay on topic. We can make a difference, power and intention in this space. We can make a positive change. No surprises. Do your best not to take people off guard. Don't look for the gotcha moments. Do your best, be curious and respectful. Listen to understand. Be fully present and engaged. Have grace with yourself and others. We're all figuring this out together. Use common conversational courtesy. Ask questions instead of making assumptions. Take space, make space. Share your perspective while making space for others so we can hear from everyone. Lean into discomfort and learning together. Practice examining the big picture beyond your current view. Think about who is not at the table. I think that's one that, that we probably need to always keep in mind. Be aware of how you act on your power, privilege, and advantage, and have courage to interject if something is going amiss or being left unsaid. Make the invisible visible. Okay. All right. If you are comfortable with those board, if someone would like to make like to make a motion to approve the skip executive board group agreements, I would entertain that motion. So moved. Thank you. We had a motion by Ryan. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a second by Colleen. Is there any discussion? All right. Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve skip executive board group agreements, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion to approve the executive board group agreements has been approved unanimously. Thank you, Angela, again, thank you for your work on this and board, thank you for, for working through this and adding some great ideas to the mix. All right, we will move on to item B, executive board rules of procedure. And the executive board rules of procedure currently requires that one elected position be held by a board member from a council manager form of government. The intention behind the requirement, I believe, was to encourage leadership opportunities that represent the diverse makeup of SKIP's jurisdictional partners. But unfortunately, uh, 
the requirement upon execution proved to be a little bit of a challenge to us for implementation and did not provide enough flexibility to account for differences in board member capacity and changes in makeup of the representatives. So Angela, I believe you have some uh, proposed revisions that you would like to share. Yeah, so this is the proposed um, revisions that are in sort of the, the lengthy document, but I pulled out just the section three, section three election of officers where there is some proposed revised language um, just to call out, there was a typo, so we've corrected that. Um, uh, and otherwise, this is just to um, really convey the um, goal here, which is to um, support and encourage that broad representation um, in our board leadership positions. So instead of saying that we're requiring um, a one of our elected positions be from a council manager form of government. Um, we're really including more of a value statement that um, recognizing that SKIP consists of regional and local jurisdictions across South King County that range in size and type of government structure. The SKIP executive board values and strong, strongly encourages diverse representation in elected offer, officer positions that reflects that diversity. So really it's just to kind of convey more of a value statement rather than a requirement um, to um, the chair's point that creates um, a level of flexibility as our representation might change. And then also thinking about, we do have folks serving that are in various positions within their government um, structure. And so just kind of recognizing that and recognizing that just because you're from a council manager um, form of government that doesn't necessarily reflect all of the diversity that this board um, represents in the experience at the table. So that is the that is the proposal um, that I had and um, I believe um, Tracy also um, had a proposed addition that was not included in your agenda packet, but I do have it in front of me. And I don't know if Tracy, you want to um, speak to that or we should wait for a motion to include that in discussion. I'm fine with however you wanna do this, Angela, whatever you're most comfortable with. Let me go ahead and put it up here for you all to see. Um, and Tracy, please feel free to speak to this as well. Um, but Tracy brought up um, some um, kind of basic principles of decorum. I mean, this kind of gets at some of the things that we talked about within those group agreements, but this is really more formally um, included in the rules of procedure um, and just really kind of speaks to um, more of the formal process that you all have. And I think a lot of this is covered in the Roberts Rules of Order, but we don't always have that giant book in front of us. So this is a little bit easier way to maybe get at some of those things that we wanna be reminded of um, in meetings. So Tracy, I don't know if you have anything to add to this um, suggestion here. Uh, no, I, you did a great job. I that This little uh, interchange, it was kind of in response to the previous item that we just went through that this, uh, a lot of cities have in their rules of procedure, rules of decorum. And I thought it would be nice if our rules of procedure reflected the document that we were just considering in the item before. So this kind of, it's just a reinforcement of respect and kindness. Okay. Tell you what, since we, had the the motion or the proposed motion in our packets let's first see if there is a motion to approve uh, the items that were first included by angela there the election of officers is there a motion to um, a motion to approve the amending of the executive board rules of procedure? So 
So moved. Thank you. We have a motion from Dana to approve the amendments to the executive board rules of procedure. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. We have a second from Ryan. All right. This motion is on the floor. Now, if there is an amendment to this motion, this would be an appropriate time to make that amendment. Is there an is there a motion to amend the original motion to include the rules of order? So are you I'm so, sorry, Chair, are you saying that this would be the time right now to well, let me clarify a little. I, I there probably a little misunderstanding on my behalf. As we brought the this agreement to the table, I was thinking that this would be an easier, a more uh, an easier, shorter way to accomplish maybe the same thing. But I see now from our uh, conversation a couple minutes ago the value of having a separate document like a um, a code of ethics, and so. I think that this item in regard to the rules of procedure is covered pretty well in this document that we just approved. So I, I don't have a super strong investment in this. It could be considered redundant. It is a nice addition, but it, it, it was originally intended to be a, a shortcut to the other document. Okay. So um, I, unless somebody else wants to, it feels pretty strong that this is valuable. I don't mind eliminating it. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I am not hearing anyone's motion to amend the original motion. All right. So Angela, if you could go back to the original for the sake of the impending vote so that everyone can see that. There we go. All right. So is there any discussion on the motion on the floor to amend the executive board rules of procedure? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve uh, the executive board rules of procedure, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say no. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And thank you, Angela, for your work on this. Uh, when she first brought it to me a couple of months ago, she goes, this is a little messy the way it is right now. So thank you for working on this, for identifying that messiness and for helping us unmessify it. All right, we will move on to new business. I think that is right. So under new business, the 2022 skip housing capital fund priorities and the advisory board has been working together to draft priorities for the skip housing capital fund no action is proposed at this time uh, this meeting is an opportunity to discuss and provide feedback on the draft priorities for the advisory board member uh, who is with us today dorsal thank you for for sticking in with us here uh, and to consider before bringing forward a formal recommendation to the May Executive Board meeting. And additional feedback may also be provided to Angela by April 25th for incorporation into the May 5th Advisory Board discussion and finalization of the recommendation on capital fund priorities. Angela, I will turn it back over to you to provide that overview. Great, thank you so much. Um, Mayor Backus did a great job of um, 
doing an overview. Um, the advisory board has been um, developing priorities for the SKIP Housing Capital Fund. Um, just to kind of reiterate um, where we're at with the capital fund, the executive board um, has gone through a set of evaluation criteria and um, really been working quite a bit on that. I know we haven't visited it recently, um, but the priorities that the advisory board have been looking at are really ways to um, think about and compare applications that come in. So they aren't requirements that individual applications absolutely have to meet, but they are just kind of setting some overarching priorities of um, where the housing needs are um, and what we really want to see um, our capital fund go towards. So just because a priority is set does not necessarily mean um, that one application um, either has to meet all of those um, or even a component of those, because we could get a really exciting, wonderful project that meets South King County needs that maybe is a priority we hadn't considered, um, but it is a way, um, a tool for the advisory board and the executive board to really think about um, those applications and really um, give um, applicants the opportunity to see um, where our priorities as well as they think about responding to a notice of funding. So in terms of process, um, the executive board and the staff work group, we wanted to make sure to bring forward um, the work that the advisory board has been um, working on and get some feedback, um, bring forward any questions or um, considerations that you might have um, back to the advisory board um, before bringing a um, formal recommendation at the May 20th meeting for the executive board um, consideration for ad adoption. So I will follow up um, just immediately following this with a draft of these priorities um, and then that deadline of April 25th um, so that we can make sure and bring whatever feedback or considerations you have to the next advisory board discussion um, at their meeting on May 5th. So in terms of the priorities themselves, um, the advisory board identified um, some target population groups um, the really the intention behind all of these is to really touch on populations that have been the most impacted by housing affordability um, and the housing crisis across the South King County region. So the intention here is to be really inclusive, um, not necessarily to define um, specific individual populations um, and kind of um, you know, be too, too exclusive, I guess. We wanna make sure that we have a broad representation of all of the um, populations that have been um, marginalized um, specifically by um, housing issues across the region. I don't need to read these out. I'm letting you all kind of, kind of do that. And I will follow up, like I said, with a draft of this. Um, the second area is around the type of housing. So just as a reminder, um, with the SKIP Housing Capital Fund, the source of funds is required to serve households um, earning 60% of our area median income or less. And the advisory board um, really wanted to focus on and create a priority for um, consideration of those um, housing projects that would serve zero to 30% of the area median income. So really recognizing that across South King County, um, that's where significant need is and all of the communities is at, is at that zero to 30%. And then also incorporating home ownership. So recognizing that at 60% of area median income, it may be challenging um, to get a home ownership project, but not necessarily wanting to leave that out either because recognizing that home ownership is a pretty significant um, gap and also um, a way for folks to build um, wealth um, and intergenerational wealth specifically. And then the, the last one there is supportive housing. So um, thinking about housing holistically and the services and supports that might go along with um, housing development, especially those that are serving some of the more vulnerable populations in the lower income categories where we see that high need. And then in terms of location, um, there was talk about um, incorporating kind of an overarching 
um, objective that um, the Skip Housing Capital Fund really wants to produce housing across the Skip sphere of influence, um, creating a broad distribution um, in location and all types of housing. So this is really just um, kind of a value statement and a goal that we keep in mind over time as we um, go through funding cycles that we are um, thinking about the distribution um, of the housing that SKIP is supporting um, over the life of um, our housing capital fund. And then the second one with regard to location is thinking about transit oriented development um, and the um, sort of significant changes that are happening with regard to transit um, in South King County and the potential um, locations um, and projects that might come up with that. So wanting to um, incorporate a transit oriented development um, priority in here as well. In terms of the type of projects, um, thinking about those that are collaborative in nature, organizations working in partnership um, with local um, BIPOC or community-based organizations or developers um, and showing a priority there to those that are really um, invested um, in working within um, our South King County communities already. And then also um, a recognition of preservation. So not just housing, new housing construction, but preservation of affordable housing um, that has expiring affordability requirements. Um, sorry for my typo here. <laughs> housing, not hosing. <laughs> um, and then um, the local support. Um, this was um, quite a bit of a conversation um, with the advisory board around um, priority for developers that have demonstrated some community connections and then also direct experience with the populations that they are proposing to serve. Um, and um, thinking about um, how they can demonstrate um, that connection and community engagement um, would be incorporating a letter of support from community-based organizations, churches, community centers, or schools um, as part of their application to really show that local support and connection. Um, I know you all have talked about showing a letter of consistency coming from um, the um, government, the local government where the project might be cited, and this would be really looking for um, a show of local support from the community as well. And then a priority for funding is um, to show um, the ability to leverage other public and private investments. Um, I think we've all talked quite a bit about this, but really um, wanting to make sure um, that we are in a position um, to leverage these public dollars and the necessity of that because um, we aren't able to fund an entire project, but we need projects that are able to um, leverage other types of investments. Um, and then also a priority here for projects that may have already secured funding. So thinking about projects that may just need this last little bit to um, come to fruition, but they already have um, a lot of their funding in place. And then lastly, um, an other category, apologies for the, for the category, but these were kind of the things that weren't captured in any of the other ones. Um, but a commitment to supporting organizations who involve the community in their decision-making process. Um, this is um, a little bit different, um, but related to that local support component as well. Um, and then also a focus on um, racial equity. So with that, I am going to um, stop sharing and open it up to you all for questions. And just as a reminder, this was really to provide an overview, address any questions that you might have, um, but wanted to um, also just remind you all that you'll have a chance to um, go back to your jurisdictions, talk to staff for your other councils, um, and submit additional feedback um, by that April 25th date that we could bring to the advisory board as well. Questions, comments? Eric. Um, thank you. And I, I may have missed the meetings in which this um, fund was originally proposed, but can you um, uh, help me understand what's the intended funding mechanism 
um, for uh, seeding the fund. Yeah, for the SKIP housing capital fund itself? Yeah, correct. Yes. Um, so currently, um, our funding is all based on pooled resources from um, Skip City's um, sales tax credit resources, so made possible by um, legislation passed in 2019 for cities to recapture a portion of sales tax. Um, so those funds amount to about a million dollars per year um, pooled together. And um, this in this funding round, um, estimated we'll have about a million and a half dollars um, for this funding round. Thank you. And is that um, mechanism automatic or statutory? Or was that um, passed through city councils uh, previously? Yes. So okay. that was passed through your city councils. Um, each of the skip city councils passed the legislation. There were some requirements on timing within the legislation, and all of the skip cities um, have done that. Um, Great. Thank you. So Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, you're just catching me up. I appreciate it. Yes, of course. Other questions or comments? Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I, I'm on my on my phone now. My computer crashed right in the middle of the meeting and won't let me do one thing. So just, just as a little um, amendment to that for Eric is, if, for reference, it's 1406, right? Isn't that correct, Angela? House Bill 1406. So if you wanted to look that up, uh, I thought I would add that in if you wanted background. Thank you, Tracy. Any other questions or comments? Thoughts on, on this? So no action obviously today, but would hope to take action on it in the future at a future meeting. Dana. Just wanna add, I'm really pleased to see the home ownership piece in there. Um, it was very inspiring to hear about the work that's being done in Renton and Tukwila around that and um, would love to see that option grow for um, residents in the rest of South County. So really happy um, to see that there. Great, Sonari. Yeah, I, um, we're definitely, I think at the county, kind of bolstering our interest in affordable home ownership. I would caution though with 1406, because it's capped at 60% AMI, it's a little bit tough, um, but I, still think it's something we, we should keep, you know, keep our eye on and understand what is possible. Um, and then I, I operationally, we're going to get those slides with that afterwards to be able to digest it a little better. I was looking, combing through the board packet quickly. I'm like, I don't see this. And I have a hard time absorbing You didn't take the screenshot scenario. I mean, you know, I'm busy looking pictures of my kid because she's at the <laughs> other family. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, just I think there's a, a couple areas where some framing, you know, every once in a while, my little fair housing sensor goes off and I'm like, target populations, let's be clear about what we mean by that. So we're not running afoul of any laws, but we're able to say that we, we want to, you know, emphasize organizations that have the capacity to serve, or they're going to do affirmative marketing to, or things like that, that kind of keep us above board. Um, but I like the direction it's heading. Um, happy to help provide comment. Great. Thank you very much. Anything else for the Housing Capital Fund priorities? And for those of you, yes, that didn't take screenshots of all of those words that Angela put up on the screen, we will make sure that you get those and then be quicker about it next time. <laughs> Sorry, we have to have a little fun along the way. It's been a long, long week. All right. Um, Updates and announcements. I am going to take personal privilege and go first. I typically try and wait until everyone else has gone, but I am going to, Christina, great to see you. If you haven't already left, thank you. Uh, have a wonderful, have, wonderful weekend. Great. I have not. Thank you so much for having me here. I know I'm the alternate, but it's always a lot of fun with you guys. Always appreciate you being here with us. You're always welcome. Thank you so much. An amazing weekend. Happy Easter. <laughs> Happy Easter. 
So uh, most of you, I believe, read uh, with probably very, very mixed emotion the email that Trish sent out about this being her last day with Skip. Um, I, was, I was sad for us, excited for Trish for a new opportunity, uh, but just could not allow the opportunity for us to acknowledge you, Trish, and uh, spread some love over you as you move forward with another amazing opportunity, uh, working with Habitat for Humanity, great, great organization. So my hope is that we have chances to work with you in the future on, on things that we are doing as part of SKIP and uh, would just thought I would open it up to others who might like to spread some praise on Trish for your time with us here, your extensive knowledge on the topics, helping to educate us and being very gracious in your approach. Anyone have any, have any thoughts they would like to share? Sonari. Yeah, definitely echo everything you just said, Chair, and, and you know, extend thanks to Trish. Trish also helped our, our team as a member of the Affordable Housing Committee, the Equity and Social Justice team. I know she's done a lot in, in really standing up and getting the advisory board going, and, and that has been truly awesome, and we're going to miss you, but I hope we will, we will still see you around. I also am wondering, Chair, if you might amend your previous rule about who can speak so that if there are folks who are not board members who might want to recognize her, they are also able to do that. Certainly, if, if anyone would like to, to embarrass Trish a little bit this afternoon, uh, I, will, I will suspend the rules. <laughs> probably a little bit emotional for some people to to be able to uh, say anything. But Dana, I will call on you. Yeah, um, I just want to say thank you. Um, for me, the work that stands out is the process as we went through setting up the advisory board and your willingness to have the conversation about the whys and what we should be considering. And, um, you know, it took us a little bit. I, it took me a little bit to try and um, really get to the the purpose and making sure that that, um, that group was set up in a really positive, um, powerful way. So thank you for all of your work on that. And there are a couple of comments in the chat box. And let's see, from Joy, Trish, thank you for everything you've done in South King County to support safe and affordable homes for all. We will all miss you. Hannah, Trish has been an amazing contributor and support to the staff working group. We will miss you, Trish. From Marina, Trish, you are amazing and we will miss you. Thank you so much for joining our team. Congratulations and best of luck on your new adventure. And Colleen, so appreciative everything about you, Trish. We're going to miss you. Hope you know how much you are loved. And from Michaela, Trish, I agree with everyone. You will be greatly missed. Our loss is Habitat's gain. So um, I hope you know you are always welcome back to join us. And again, I, I have a strong feeling that this is not the last time that we are going to have the wonderful benefit of working with you, Trish. And so nothing but the very best moving forward for you. Uh, think about us from time to time. And uh, if you have great ideas or great opportunities for us, please don't hesitate. Uh, and Paul, uh, Trish, an amazing couple years in different roles, your continual presence in so many forums has been a gift. And I would echo that. And one, one other uh, person that I would like to recognize because I will not be at the May 20th meeting. There is a memorial service for one of the founders of Green River College that conflicts with that timing. Uh, but Mark Santos Johnson, uh, who is on the call, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, Mark, but Mark shared uh, with me earlier in the week that he has uh, announced his retirement 
and that the May 20th meeting will be his last meeting of Skip. And um, you are an amazing person, Mark. I so appreciate your years and years of dedicated service to this region to allow people to be in safe and affordable housing and uh, I will, I will miss your sage wisdom, your willingness to make challenging comments when you know it was for the good of what we are wanting to accomplish, uh, being a positive role model for all of us to, to emulate. And I am going to miss you, uh, but also know that you are going to enjoy your retirement and this next phase of your journey, spending more of the time that you cherish with your family. And so I just wanted to say thank you uh, in front of the board for all of your work. Thank you, Mayor Backus. I was uh, hoping I could wait till next month. <laughs> uh, yeah. today's, today's about Trish. Um, I would like to say a few comments next month, but I appreciate your um, acknowledgement. And uh, I take great pride in, you, in your collective work. You, you have been a guiding light through through all of that. Uh, and yes, we um, we are much better off for both Trish and Mark being a part of this organization and their passion and their dedication to this work. So thank you both. And unless there are any other comments or announcements, Man, we stayed ahead of schedule today. Four minutes of sunshine left for you. Dorsal, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure meeting you and thank you for your work on our advisory council. Uh, it is incredibly meaningful for this entire region and I, I'm sure you know that. Thank you all for those of you that celebrate Easter. I hope you have a wonderful Easter and um, spending time with family and friends and that we have some sunshine and that you are all proud of the work that we do collectively and each of you do individually. I am humbled in your presence knowing how very dedicated you are to this region. Thank you so much. Till next time. Bye-bye.